Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 37, we're going to take a look at the differences between tubes, when they are important and when they're not. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. If you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Lately, I've been answering more questions than usual about minor differences in tubes that customers have received. So it seems like a good time to have a quick look at these. We're going to look at a bunch of tubes and see if we can sort out what is important and what's not. Let's get going, and because I want to cover lots of ground, I'm going to keep moving fast. Okay, let's start off with the Sylvania 6SN7. Even though these are rebranded, RCA, Rogers and Rogers, these are all identical tubes to the ones that are, that are labeled correctly by Sylvania. Rebrands were just manufacturers normally of equipment but other things as well that just wanted their name on their tubes they could be tube resellers it didn't matter they're exactly the same tube so let's look at the early gta i think these are from the late 1950s they weren't made for that long and they have a straight plate you see that so there's no angle on the plate just like the bad boys that came before them in the 1950s, the GTs. Now these are the next generation. Let's get the label up so you can see it. Can you see that? It says, there you go, GTA. Okay, so the more common, and those are great sounding tubes, one of my favorite 6SN7s. And here's another great sounding one. And have a look. Angled plates. Now from this point on, Sylvania built all their 6SN7s with pretty much with angled plates. Different size bottles, different size bases, but the plates basically stayed the same. And have a look. So there we go. That, I don't know if you can see it or not, but it says GTA. So can you mix and match these? After all, they're both GTAs. They both are supposed to have identical specifications. No, you can't. You, you've got to keep the straight plates with the straight plates and the GTA angle plates with the angle plates. There, there's definitely a, ver a significant variation in production, right? We can all see that. Okay, moving on, we've got another tube that looks exactly like the GTA. It's got angle plates, short bottle, or medium bottle. Ah, let's look at the back here. What have we got on top? Uh, these are GTBs. So, and these are all actually matched pairs down here. So what's important? Well, what's important is we don't mix up the GTAs and the GTBs. Even if electrically they're very similar, there's probably enough of a variation in the decade between manufacturing that we're going to see some differences in sound. They both sound great. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about differences in in sound. So what is really important though is our testing numbers. So we want, first of all, we want, in this case, this is a twin triode, so two tubes in one envelope, which is very common. One of the most common twin triodes, of course, is the 12AX7, a much smaller tube. So 83 and 81, that's um, just a hair over 2% variation, right? 8179, same thing. This is a matched pair. So anywhere, 5% or less is it's considered perfect. But with older tubes from the 50s and 60s and older, um, anywhere inside of a 10% variation is perfectly acceptable. And it's, you won't hear the difference in sound. You want to keep it inside of 10 though. Okay. So we've learned labels don't matter testing numbers do and major variations in manufacturing they matter as well okay let's jump into one of my favorite 6SL7s the melts tube for a different kind of a variation some of the tubes not very many 
have a different mica spacer. See that? That's oval. This is the common one, the rectangular one. Now, why did that happen? I have no idea. Did melts just run out of the rectangular ones? Were they using up smaller pieces of mica to make ovals? Is there a minor specification requirement that use the oval for some tubes? Did they switch suppliers? Who knows? I don't think many of the people who made these tubes are long gone, so who knows if there's any answer to that question. They don't seem to be date dependent. So it could be they just grabbed from another production run uh, a mica that worked when they ran out of the more common rectangular ones. What's important is the numbers and whether they sound the same. And the numbers we match up, and in listening tests, I can't discern any difference. So is it fine to use a variation like this? In this case, I would say yes. It would be perfectly acceptable. Okay, let's put those down somewhere safe. Let's do some power tubes. Now this is this is the weirdest looking match quad of Svetlana EL34. It's vintage Svetlana's that I've ever put together, but it's perfect for discussing this whole business about whether a tube is matchable or not. So let's look at this one. This is a little weird. This happens sometimes. You notice how the tube didn't get glued into the base perfectly. So it's a little on an angle. Is that going to affect the sound? No. Mesa is the label here. That's a rebrander, of course. Mesa did a lot of rebranding of um, guitar amplifier tubes. And they put their own product number on it, of course. It always starts with an STR. Is this a vintage Svetlana tube identical? Yes, of course it is. What about this? Marshall, same thing. The Marshall, of course, is a well-known um, guitar amplifier manufacturer. And they have um, generations of different labels. So they must have had a contract with Svetlana um, that spanned decades, because I've seen multiple different kinds of labels. So is this the real McCoy? Yep, it is. What about this one? This has got one of the uh, much loved vintage Svetlana labels. You see the, can you see it there? It's got a big capital C with some wings on each side. So sometimes it's called the wing C or the flying C. And the C is the, in the Russian Cyrillic is R-S in the West, right? So Svetlana in English. So that all makes sense, yeah. So of course, that's the real McCoy. And here's one with the more modern stylized S, big blocky Art Deco label. Now that's another one. So can we use these together? Well, what are the testing numbers? 28 milliamps, 32 milliamps, 31, 31. That's that's nice and tight. That's that's a good close matched quad with a crooked tube. <laughs> Actually, I think this one might be on slightly. I think so too. We got two crooked tubes. Um, so that's what matters really is not the aesthetics, it's the electrical. Now, if if I can, I'm going to give you the aesthetics, but what I'm going to do first when I match vintage quads is I'm going to get a good, as close a match as I can. I actually will do that first, and then I do aesthetics second. If we, if we look at aesthetics first and forget about the numbers, we're going to end up with an awful lot of poor sounding matches, right? Okay, let's put these aside carefully. Let's bring these up carefully, because these are some of the best. Those Svetlanas were, are superb sounding EL34s, 34, EL and they're affordable. These are expensive EL34s. These are original Mullards. These are the XF2 series. And let's just take a look. And they're all different. And this is not a matched quad, folks. They're hard to come by. There's actually a matched pair sitting in here somewhere. There it is. These two are a matched pair. Let's have a quick look at this one. So, this is a Phillips space. What the heck's up with that? Well, Phillips owned Mullard. Ah, okay. So Phillips didn't make EL34s. They were involved in the design work, of course. Um, but they were made in Great Britain. There's your hint. <laughs> Can you see Great Britain? Whenever you see Great Britain on a 
on, etched it like that on a tube. It's, I always say that's red alert, red alert. <laughs> it might be a mullard. Now, how do we know for sure? Well, I know this too because I specialize in it. So I can spot these things in a picture a kilometer away, right? <laughs> but it's very it's a very distinctive tube. It's got these little claws on the upper mica, smooth on the bottom, two narrow slits. But what the real giveaway, and that that's actually another giveaway, 6CA7 in that kind of a print. But what really gives these away is the is the manufacturing code. All of the Phillips companies, and there were quite a few of them, there must have been a dozen or more, um, use the same manufacturing code. And I, I actually did a tube lab in the past about identifying European tubes, so you can go back and watch that if you want. Let's see if we can find one that's nice and clear. Oh, here's a beautiful one. Have a look at that. Can you see it? XF2 at the top, so that's the series. And we happen to know that XF2 were 1960s. At the bottom, it starts with the manufacturing plant. So capital B is Blackburn, England. And then the digit is four. So that's the digit of the year. So 1964, because we know these are from the 60s. And the A and 2 is the month and the week. So this one is, says Dynaco by Mullard. So we've got the date. Uh, the manufacturing code, we've identified the, the plate structure, so we know this is a mullet. And Dynaco, which was a big tube manufacturer, a uh, big uh, tube uh, amplifier manufacturer back in the day, uh, and made uh, made kits as well, um, they they tubed up with um, these these beautiful sounding mullets. Can you imagine that? You would buy a, a Dynaco kit was an affordable amplifier and you got some of the best sounding uh, EL34s ever made? Wow! So, <laughs> and the Dynacos are well-respected amplifiers even today. There's a whole group of people that really love them and restore them. And upgrade them as well. Okay, so we know that's a real Mullard. What about this Valvo? That, geez, that sounds like a completely different company, doesn't it? And it is a completely different company, but they didn't make the EL34s. They would, they would bring them in because they're all related companies, they would bring them in, and there's your code, XF2. This is from 1961. So that's a real, that's the real McCoy. What about this one? It's got, it's got no label on it. Oh, it's got a smudged kind of thing, but we can, if we put a magnifying glass and some good light, we'll see that it's an XF2 as well. What if we didn't have anything? Well, we'd use the physical identification method, right? We'd look at the plate, we look at the rivets, in this case they're welded, can you see that? We look at the size of the slits, location, we look at the micas, we look at the getter, way up here, how it's supported, how big it is, we look at the base, we look at, you know, in this case they have a distinctive little hole in the, in the key, and the molding around here also can be a giveaway. So, if these had good testing numbers, they are identical tubes. Now, because the many vintage tubes are fairly rare, it's impossible to match by year. You would, you would have to have a hundred of these tubes in probably, maybe 200 to get all, let's say 1961, is, and then get the right numbers. So what I go for is the numbers first. Well, I do, in this case, I do the series first, right? They're all XF2s. Then I go for um, then I go for the number. I want to know what what the emission is. I want it nice and close, within five percent if possible. Tens acceptable, and then I do aesthetics. If I can if I can get good aesthetics, I go for it. If I can't, we live with what we get, right? Okay. Well, that was boring, <laughs> but it was something that needed to be talked about. I think so. Let's put these away somewhere safe. I've actually got a bin set up so I don't absolutely I don't flip these off the table. It's happened. I don't keep those outtakes. It's just too embarrassing when I kill a tube by accident. I'm in shame. <laughs> okay, so as you know, one of my favorite tubes for the 6SN7, my go-to is is very much the Sylvania. And a whole bunch came in from a wholesaler. 
and they're all tested. They're going to go in the store shortly. Have a look at this. This is a fairly rare one. This is made, I think, around the same time as the Bad Boy in the 1950s. And it's got a really unusual... Can you see that plate? Look at that thing. It's got... It's a big flat offset plate. Now, Sylvania normally made the elevated black tea plate, right? Straight or uh, angled. This thing's got seven rivets, I think. Two on one side, five on the other. I don't know about this tube. It's a... It's a high demand tube. There aren't that many of them around. There, there are some, but there aren't that many around. I suspected, I have suspected that Sylvania made this, had this made for them under contract, but I've never seen another one that looked like that. So Sylvania may have made this interesting tube um, as a, sort of a special contract or they were trying something different. Who knows? But anyways, they come in in drips and drabs. Sort of like the Muller um, EL34s. I get one or two in the mail at a time, and that's it. But a whole bunch of the GTAs came in with the angle plate, and actually one match pair with the straight plate. And audio files, um, when it comes to the various 6 and 7s by Sylvania, their go-to is, the, um, is the GTA. It just does everything really well. It's a much-loved tube. There is enough of them around from the late 50s and early 60s that uh, it's possible to get good tight matched pairs and and I can even do quads on occasion. Uh, some some preamplifiers need four of these suckers. And um, so a whole bunch of those came in. We'll get them into the store. And oh yes, look at this. The, these, this is going to be one of the hardest tubes to stock and keep in stock. These are the Melt 6SL7s. And enough came in that I was able to match up four used pairs. And have a look at these. Now, the Melt tubes, they often show, they show badly. It's just, it's just the way they were made. Have a look. You see that little split there? Now, you would think that tube is buggered, right? Well, this is just a holder. It just marries the glass to the base. It doesn't seal the vacuum, right? The vacuum is underneath here is the glass. So, is that an issue? If it's structurally sound, now I haven't repaired this tube, sometimes I do, if I need to, but it's, it's in there solid. So it's not an issue, it's aesthetic, and of course it's price used, it actually looks very much like a new tube, and it's testing like a new tube. But because it's got a little split, it goes in as a used tube. Let's look at another one of these. Um, they're not all that bad, but the numbers are good. Have a look at this one here. Let me just unclip it so we can look at it. 82 and 84, 82, 84. So that's almost an exact match pair. Fairly unusual for melts. The numbers are all over the place. This one's got a nice, clean-looking base. This one's got corrosion. Now, what in the world... Let me get that up so you can see it. What in the world is that? Well, even if this tube didn't see any abuse during its lifetime, maybe even it mostly sat in a box, it probably has seen salt air. Now, the Russians have and had a large international fishing fleet, and they had a had and have... Uh, a very large navy. So most likely this sat on a, either a fishing boat or in a navy vessel and salt air corrodes metal like you wouldn't believe. So is this a problem? Well the material didn't like the salt air so it showed a little bit of corrosion but the electronics they're all inside a vacuum right? They're not exposed to the air outside so they're perfectly fine. The pins are beautifully coated to resist corrosion and no, if the numbers are testing good and the tube is quiet and it sounds good, then this is an aesthetic. It's nothing to worry about. And of course, you pay less than a new tube because it's um, it looks used. You know, even if the numbers in my my rule in the book is even if the numbers are new old stock, if the tube looks used, it is used, right? Which is fair, I think. Okay, so those are actually are in the store. I just put them in this morning. And if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes you can use. Remember, I've got 
flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.